My name is Lizzie Shea, I'm the director of UDIS Kultur Sveje, and we present this special program together with Yiddis Selskopet i Stockholm. And with me is Abbe Schulman, I will let him say a few words, and then I will introduce our um, host, Eric Goldman. Please, Abbe. Jag heter Sabi Schulman, jag är ordförande i Idrottsdelskapet i Stockholm. Och vi har haft glädjen att ha ett samarbete med Jules Kultur i Sverige. I fjol så hade vi en konsert och ett stort seminarium kring litteratur, film och teater. Och det här är en fortsättning. Jag skulle vilja säga några ord bara om Jiddisch. Jiddisch var ju ett språk, som, det är inte bara ett språk utan det är också en kultur. Och det var en kultur som var faktiskt dominerande inom den judiska gruppen. Så före andra världskriget så var det 12 miljoner judar som pratade jiddisch. Eh, och av de 6 miljonerna som mördades under kriget så var ju majoriteten jiddisch talande. Eh, och det fanns en fantastisk... Eh, eh, Kultur, det var mycket teater, det var massor med böcker som skrevs eh, och det var filmer som gjordes och ni kommer att få se några stycken av dem här. Eh, ni kommer att få se äldre filmer och ni kommer att få se moderna filmer. Eh, och det som är roligt och det, därför jag tycker det är så viktigt att vi gör det här eh, det är att den här jiddisch kulturen har fått en slags renaissance de här senaste åren. Det är visst beroende på att Yiddish är ett nationellt minoritetsspråk i Sverige, som ni kanske vet. Eh, Yiddish, eh, det görs filmer på Yiddish. Det spelas teater på Yiddish, bland annat här i Stockholm. Så att eh, nästa år så kommer det bli en pjäs igen, tror jag. Hoppas det. Hoppas vi också. Ja, på Yiddish. Eh, för säga det att Yiddish-teatern i Stockholm är ganska unik. Det spelas ju teater på andra håll, men inte bara på jiddisch, utan man lägger ofta in ett annat språk. Men här i Stockholm så spelar vi bara på jiddisch. Det finns en jiddisch kör i Stockholm, det finns läsesirklar i Stockholm på jiddisch. Och vi jiddischelskapet har över 200 medlemmar. Är ni, är ni intresserade så blir gärna medlem. Med de, med de orden så älskar jag också er hjärtligt välkomna. Och jag tror och hoppas att det här kommer att bli en spännande helg med jiddisch och jiddisch film. Tack för att ni kom. Tack Ben och tack Ben Auerbach. It's been a great pleasure to be working with you. Actually, our journey started a year ago with the program that Abbe mentioned. And um, it was March 2018. And then we had the pleasure of hosting Eric Goldman who spoke about um, Yiddish cinema. And we thought that his uh, lecture was so good and people liked it, so we invited him to curate a program with Yiddish cinema. And as Abbe said, we tried to give, um, well, a glimpse into the old films, the very old films, and the newer ones, to give different uh, perspectives to what's happening. And what do younger film directors do when they deal with Yiddish? Eric Goldman is a historian of Yiddish cinema. He's a professor, cinema professor at Yeshiva University, and he is a host and a producer of a TV program which you could see online. It's about Jewish Cinematech, uh, produced by Jewish Broadcasting Service. So Eric will tell you more about each film that we're going to um, show, uh, watch together and we're very happy also to have the filmmakers some of them of course not those are the old ones but we have um, Yossi Sommer and uh, Yair Kedar and Emmanuel Finkel who will join us um, Yair from Israel Yossi from Norway and Emmanuel from Paris so I wish you all a good weekend meaningful weekend uh, for us at Yudis Kultur Israel uh, this cooperation is very important. It's another um, aspect of our work that which we like to explore even more. So thank you so much for the good advice, for the cooperation, Yiddish Elskopet Istverje Ok Stockholm. And uh, now I have the pleasure to invite Eric Goldman. 
Thanks, Lizzie. What a, a pleasure it is to be with you. Um, I'd like to just spend a few minutes to talk about the weekend and how we came up with the films that we are screening. Uh, Yiddish cinema came into being 108 years ago, 107 years ago, when uh, a very enterprising gentleman decided to record his wife on the stage, so he sat on the front row with a movie camera and recorded her. Uh, his name was Abraham Kaminsky. His wife was a Yiddish actor named Esther Rojo Kaminska, uh, who was the grand dame of Yiddish theater. You may know her uh, by, as the mother of Ida Kaminska. And uh, that's how Yiddish cinema began. It began largely as a silent uh, medium, and uh, Yiddish films were made in Poland, in Russia, both before the Soviet Union and during the Soviet Union with actual funding from the Russian Soviet government, uh, and also in the United States. So that whole silent period came to an end as silent movies stopped being made <coughs> as we get to the late 1920s, around 1930, and movie makers realized that there is an audience. Who is that audience? They are Yiddish-speaking immigrants primarily, all across Europe, Sweden, and the United States. Uh, these are people who do not necessarily know the language, and it is their opportunity to be entertained in the language uh, in, in their, in their mamaloshin. So uh, this is what happens in the early 1930s. But the quality was actually very poor. Uh, there was not enough, enough money to make films. Uh, a lot of the people involved in Yiddish filmmaking came from the theater and could not make the adjustment to making movies and directing actors, not just for the stage, but for the camera. And unfortunately, some of the great actors of the 1930s are captured on film giving in incredibly poor performances. Um, and then around 1936, uh, a gentleman who I call the Dean of the Yiddish Theater because he began making Yiddish films or at least silent Jewish films in the teens, his name was Sidney M. Golden, uh, is given an opportunity and a budget to make a film of some quality. Why does this happen in 1936? Because a very enterprising fellow named Joseph Green, a Polish-born Jew who went to the United States and then went back to Poland to make a film called Yiddel mit dem Fiddle, Yiddel with the Fiddle, which we are ending the festival with. He brought that film across Europe and into the United States with a very nice budget for a Yiddish film and the film made a lot of money. It was well made. It drew an audience. It got good reviews. So suddenly they turned to Golden and they said, hey, if Joseph Green can do this with Yiddel Mitten Fiddle, why can't we do it in the United States? So they went to Sidney Golden, the dean of Yiddish cinema. He had been making two, three, four terrible movies a year. And they said, Sidney, now you've got the money. Now you can do it. So do it. So what did they want to do? The jazz singer had been such a success, and it ushered in the sound era, how many of you have ever seen the 1927 silent film, The Jazz Singer? Well, if you haven't seen it, go back and look at it because it's a film about a Jewish boy whose father is a cantor and the father wants him to follow in his footsteps. So Golden said, if the jazz singer was so successful, let's do the same thing. That film was based on the actual life story of Al Jolson, and Jolson himself stars in The Jazz Singer. So they looked around who could fill the part. 
You have to understand America in the 1930s. You had a lot of very poor immigrants, some of whom couldn't afford to even go to the theater. So what was the second best, or in many cases, the best type of entertainment that cost no money whatsoever? You went to shul on Shabbos, and you listened to the chazan. You listened to the cantor. And as a result, some of these cantors became megastars. People would walk miles to hear Kusevitsky, to hear Hirschman, to hear Yossela Rosenblatt. And there was this young fellow, a very good-looking fellow, who finally made his way to America from Bessarabia through Canada because the United States wouldn't let him come in initially. His name was Moisha Oisher. And he was a very successful cantor in Brooklyn. So they said, Moisha, tell us your story. And they adapted that story, and that's the film we're going to begin our festival with. Moisha Oisher in Dem Chazen Zundel, the cantor's son. And along the way, he said, okay, you want to bring me in? You got to also bring in my wife to play a part with me. <laughs> Yiddish Chicago. <laughs> so there you have it. Moisha Oisher, Florence Weiss. In this film, you're going to see a duet, which I must tell you, I think is one of the greatest moments in Yiddish cinema. I hope you'll enjoy it. It's a vintage print. So it may look a little old to you, but let's face it, it's old. <laughs> but the Yiddish is rich and is very young. Dem chazen sundel, enjoy. I'm 
ששת ימי המעשה, ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו, אמרתי בן קודש venturing into a different kind of sphere. Uh, why would we choose a film like the Dybbuk and the Holy Apple film? The film is not in Yiddish. But if you know anything about the history of the Dybbuk, you know that Anski, who wrote the Dybbuk, wrote in Hebrew wrote in Yiddish. He wasn't quite sure what he was going to do with this final product. In fact, what happened was that um, this gentleman named Schleume Zeinville Rappaport, who took on the pen name of Anski, of S. Anski, was uh, someone who rebelled against his Jewish background and began doing anthropological studies about Russian soldiers and problems of the Russians. And then history took over. In 1903, there were pogroms. And after the revolution in Russia of 1905, there were more pogroms. And Ansky found his own Jewish identity. So as an anthropologist, instead of searching out differences and issues within the Russian world, he began to explore his own Jewishness, and in the course of doing so, began taking trips to different communities to write down and to literally take notes on different traditions and customs. One of the customs was the fact that people claimed and we'll be talking about that before the film, but people claim that they saw a dibuk. So he sits down and he writes this play, the dibuk. He's encouraged by Stanislavski to write it in Russian, which he does. He then translates it into Yiddish, brings it to the Vilna Trupe and says, do I have a play for you? But in the meantime, the czarist censor said, no way, you're not going to do that play. It's problematic, and they block it. Over the next couple of years, he tries to find other people who will do the play. One of his colleagues, one of his cohorts, is a fellow named Chaim Nachman Bialik who would later become Israel's poet laureate, takes it and he translates it into Hebrew. And then it is presented to the Habima, the new Hebrew language troupe that is in its infancy at this point. They turn it down. And then finally, it's taken and translated from Bialik's Hebrew 
back into Yiddish, and it is produced two months after Ansky passes away. He never had a chance to see the film, of uh, the play. What then happened was that over the years it was indeed performed by Habima, by the Vilna Trupa, by a number of different troops, and eventually in 1937 a Yiddish film was made. Uh, my understanding is that that film was just shown a few months ago here in Stockholm. So when we sat and we tried to figure out how do we give you a full picture of the impact of Yiddish culture and literature and cinema on the world, immediately my mind went to the work of this amazingly talented director, Yossi Sommer, who is here with us today. So if you've seen Stissel, how many of you have seen Stissel? So you know that Stissel gives us an insight into a world that many of us are not all that knowledgeable about. Well, this gentleman over here, some 25, 30 years ago, was way ahead of his time, and he produced this film, and Yossi and I are going to dialogue. Let me just introduce him, if I may. He is an artist, a social activist, a web influencer, which is a title I must confess, I wasn't even sure what it is, but it's <laughs> IT technology where he really influences the discussion that is taking place out there on the cloud. And he's also a peace activist. The film that we're going to see was the recipient of five Israeli Academy Awards. Yes, Israel has its own Oscars. Today it's called the Ophir. Back then it was the Israeli, uh, the Israeli Academy Award. This film won five, uh, five of these awards. And uh, it premiered, which is quite an honor, at the Berlin Film Festival. It was the recipient of the Gold Special Jury Award at the Houston Film Festival. Uh, and The Economist picked it as one of its 10 best magic realism pictures, pioneer magic realism pictures. So it's really my honor to welcome Yossi Sommer to the... first. <laughs> You have to teach me that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, I said in uh, Norwegian that I thank Lizzie and the committee and or and I to thank you for the uh, selection. So Yossi, tell us why, you know, I mean, here was this classic Yiddish story had been made already as a film. What drew you to this story? Uh, in... Uh, uh, the late 90s, uh, I sensed that uh, the Jewish society, the Jewish, uh, and I speak about Israel, but at large, um, is missing, missing some elements in understanding our roots. What I relate to is not necessarily the roots of the Yiddishkeit, Although I respect it a lot, but our almost pagan roots, which nobody is talking about, the black side of the religion. And then I took a journey uh, through the writings of Professor Gershom Scholem uh, to decode the Dibuk story of Ansky. When you say a journey, you mean a personal journey? My personal journey, which I would dare say, and if it was not an experience that I felt, I would not say it, going into the Pardes and coming out. And so I that's a concept, the Pardes, that not everyone understands. Can you just explain that? And I, and I, say, I want to say just, you know, I don't want to go too deep into it, uh, but the Pardes is in the Kabbalistic term for 
the orchard of knowledge. And historically, some people who ventured into that did no, not there come is a out. Saying, no, no the, yes. There is a clear saying by the Kabbalists that four people entered the Pardes and only one came alive out. It is dangerous stuff. May I just interrupt you for a second? Because in the original Dybbuk story, doesn't also Chonen... Exactly. Okay. Uh, so let's stop there because we don't want to give away the... No, no. Okay. The, the, thing, the thing is very simple. And, now, and I want to go deeper a bit in what I Please. attempted to do. And I spoke to some people yesterday a bit about it. We are thinking always in a popo Yiddish kite, and you see in the film there will be Yiddish kite because it's part of Mea Shearim and the Orthodoxy. But I wanted to challenge it, to challenge it in two ways, and I'm trying to simplify. Am I speaking slow enough? You're doing great. <laughs> Clear enough. Does everyone? Instructions. Yes. I got instructions, you know, to speak slow and clear. The first thing is, and I'm coming from a background of this European, you know, uh, family that suffered the Holocaust. Bo both my parents are alive. My father is 90 and my mother is 89. But Israel and the Jewish society, which I call the Hebrew society, because it's based on the Hebrew tribes, and we have to respect the Hebrew language and the Hebrew culture, is not only Yiddish. And I'm challenging it in a Yiddish festival. It has also Sephardic. It has also Mizrahi, which is the majority of the Jewish people today, of the Hebrew people that I'm, the way I describe it, because they suffered less from the Holocaust side, of course. So the only thing I would say, give away, I've decided to make the Kabbalist a Moroccan wise men because they are close to the spirits. They are respecting the spirits and to give him the honor. And I consulted also with some other professors and I asked them, listen, is the ceremony of the exorcism, does it have, do, do we have rules? Do we have a book? He said no. This is abstract. Everyone is doing, every Kabbalist is doing what he feels is correct. I want to add one more thing, you know, and then it will be a question. Mark. The second thing is, and it's not from the spiritual side. <clears throat> Can I give you a story from behind the scenes also? Uh, I've seen about a thousand hundred actors to choose to this movie. I've chose, chosen you know, some that became stars. And you want to just tell us their names? Uh, Ayelet Zorel, which this was her first movie. She uh, she's in Shtisel, by the way. She played. plays the, uh, the woman who's, the older woman who has, is attracted in, that, in the early scenes, in the early she, uh, uh, segments. She went with the VHS cassette to Spielberg and got a part in Munich and uh, then uh, played with Demon and Angels with uh, Tom Hanks. And who was the other person? Uh, Yechezke Lazarov, which uh, is, an, uh, is an artist himself. He's a dancer, he's a choreographer, and he's doing very well in Russia, actually, in the TV series. And, uh, the thing that I found out after researching, and I got a book which has testimonies Throughout centuries, it goes back about 600, 700 centuries ago, with 10 people testifying their names that they were present in a Dibuk session. An actual, actual Dibuk session. sighting of a Dibuk. This is not a phenomena which has to do with uh, East Europe. It is happened in Egypt, it happened in Sfat, it happened in North Africa. And the Kabbalah itself is a French was established in France, by the way. But what I want to tell you is this. 
what is the act of the Kabbalist in the exorcism? I came to some conclusion, but this is personal. There was abuse in the Jewish society. We cannot claim that it was just uh, on duty. Also sexual abuse. So I suspect, I suspect that this was a ceremony conducted in a situation of multiple personality of women, mainly women, who were abused. And the society has created, I know I'm stepping on thin ice, the society has created a ceremony to bring the demons in, bring the bad things in, and create peace and restore peace in the society. There, so was, there were also men which were in, in the given state. So Yossi, let me, let me just, not that I want to because I think we're going to challenge the audience with the film. One thing, one Please. Thing, one thing is just, and now I bring you into the method of working with the actors. And then if you know, Please. I don't want to go too much. Uh, yeah. I've received permission from my brother, who is a professor in psychology, to show Ayelet Zorel only materials, which I was asked to come in by in the therapy by a woman that felt that she's going to finish with the multiple personality aspect and she wanted to be documented. I was called in, this was years before, and I documented a situation that a woman was switching in my presence into a male and quarreling with herself and other characters. So, this is the material uh, among the methods that I used that I showed Ayelet Zorel personally under strict confidentiality and permission by the woman herself and my brother. So we are entering, so I'm bringing you into the realm of the edge of society. We will start very normal very cool, with cool music, so I'm happy there are young people here also. And we will enter slowly, slowly. What's the matter, old people can't like cool <laughs> music either? I'm 62, so I'm okay, it's okay. <laughs> and we will enter a world in Jerusalem, which you will not expect. So that's basically... So we're now going to be entering the world of Mea Sharim and the Haredi world, which to this point had pretty much been neglected in Israeli cinema. And, and what we, by the way, what we will be seeing tomorrow when we look at Black Honey, for those of you who will be joining us, this wonderful documentary about Avram Tzutzkever, is the tension of Yiddish in Israel. So here we have your choice to do this in Hebrew, because it was an Israeli film, and yet the people really are Yiddish-speaking and the choice that you made was? The setup is Be'a Sharim. Complex. I will not go into the details how we did it. Um, the Yiddish is the spirit of it. It's actually the conflict between, between the protagonist, which is the Sabra, and the Yiddish establishment. So I brought it in, into today. Wonderful. All right. Enjoy the the dipic and the happy and the uh, and the holy apple field. Thank you, Yossi. Yossi, the dipic and the holy apple field. You just explain the name to everyone. Just uh, the dipic is in, in, comes from the source name Devek, which is blue, a spirit which blows into you. The holy apple field is a Kabbalistic term in time. It's a Friday, as dusk falls. This is the moment the Kabbalist used to go out to get the Shekhinah, the high spirit. And the Holy Apple Field is just an abstract term of that moment of entering the realm of uh, the Shekhinah. Thank you so much, Yossi. <laughs> Yo, 
Kelsey, you want to please come up and join me? And let's hear a round of applause for Kelsey. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, How did the extreme religious community in Israel react to the film? They don't come to see films. <laughs> Not in the movies. But, uh, but I had an indirect uh, pressure uh, in the States, you know, uh, not to release it at the time. And what has happened in the last several years is that now you are seeing films being made by the ultra-Orthodox community and with computers and everything else, this film is actually now being seen. So an ultra-Orthodox Jew typically would not be seen in a movie theater, but they all own computers. So I don't have to say any more. Any other questions? Yes? The uh, exorcistic rituals at the end, uh, are they anyway based in what you know that this is how they do it? So the rituals of exorcism that we saw at the end, are they in any way uh, related to the research that you've done? Yes, yes. Uh, I'm relating to the book with the testimonies as I told so before. It's based on that. Uh, I'll uh, decode some of them. Uh, you see her, I mean, water. Water is a purifying element. And it's something that you they would wash the, the floors or wash her and try to get, you know, uh, her purified. It's in a sense, it's like the mikveh and all this, but the water and throwing the water is one element. There is there something which I don't know if you got, and probably most people did not get, but at ancient times, I'm going to speak of the records which I read, which are the most ancient. Ancient, can you give us an idea of? Era, what you, uh, I speak about five, six hundred years ago, old. Uh, they would construct an oven uh, in this shape and, in, uh, and we'll use sulfur. You know, sulfur. Sulfur. And we'll put uh, the candidate naked and she will have to breathe, or he will have to breathe it for a long time, and obviously they faint and things happen. But this is one of the elements. The ritual is calling, and any Kabbalist will do it, is calling for support of a minion. For a minion. They would not do it alone. As I said, they need the support of the community. They need to get the entire community, 10 people, yes, behind the Kabbalist in order to exercise, to do the exorcism. So all what is there, the stages, they are coming in with black candles, unlike any other situation, which is white candles, uh, with the talit and everything, uh, with the shofar, and they follow the orders to give the Kabbalist the strength of the community. Um, I can tell you an anecdote, because everybody is a bit serious now, and uh, you know, tell you an anecdote which is serious. The, the, the belief is that in a situation, you know, this is kind of old ancient beliefs, pagan beliefs, that in a situation like this, if the soul is exiting, if the exorcism is successful, it is ex exiting through the... Uh, the channel. Yes. Yes. Now what happened is that uh, Ayelet was so into it. You know, I... What a magnificent performance she gave. Uh, astonishing. Uh, and she was on this altar that we prepared. You know, like Mizbeach, like an altar. And at the end of the scene, her toe was bleeding. Friction, of course, friction, you know, because she was not uh, merciful to herself. She was, uh, you know, so that's, so all these aspects are, uh, but as, 
I got the advice from Professor Menachem Friedman from Bar Ilan University. There are variations on the subject. Okay. One last question, and then uh, we'll take the last two, and then we need to, uh, yeah, one, two. One. Uh, maybe it was just me, but I didn't understand, or I think I understood the connection between multiple personalities and the debug. Did you mean that the possible scientific explanation of the people that are possessed by debug are actually people with multiple personalities, or something like that? So the question is, uh, multiple personalities versus the concept of being possessed uh, I should not have said it. I should not have said it in the in the beginning. I should have left it to now. But we were talking about maybe it's too late, so I had to give it in the beginning. Look, I debated myself about these things. Yes, it's possible that this is one of the explanations. But let's be honest. Either you believe or you don't believe. And this is what I told myself. Either I believe or I don't believe. I believe. It's simple. You can say multiple personality, this, 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 this. I can tell you, I can tell you in the research, I took the producer, I had several. Uh, I, I actually produced it, but I had people because I was busy with the directing, a Belgium guy. We presented him, we did the research, and there was a situation of a D-book exorcism in Jerusalem, in Mearsharim. And we had the uh, hidden cameras in the, uh, the camera was actually in the tie, and in one of us and one in the back, and we went in and we filmed some elements that were there for, for real. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, so uh, this is, <laughs> but again, it's either you believe or you don't believe. I don't know, I can, can't tell you. It is. The most logical explanation is multiple personality. Uh, yeah. Okay, last question. Hi, maybe you answered a little bit of it, but you, you said before that the, the story of how it was filming in Mejerim was another story. Yes. Could you tell something about okay. it? Okay, um, the story was just a story. Just I'll tell just to you, uh, I don't know your name. Yes. You, yes. Me? Yeah. Marco. Marco. Uh, my brother is a professor in psychology, and I can tell you that after the film, he had a case of a woman that came to therapy. Of course, I cannot say anything. Uh, and she, her mother died, and she claimed that her mother continues to beat her from inside. So my brother, the scientist, used Kabbalistic terms from these ceremonies in order to help her. So this was a bridge to the other side. And I think it's good for him. The challenges were, I mean, uh, now I can tell you a secret. Most of the film was not filmed in Jerusalem. The film, we actually selected locations all over Israel. We saw Israel as our map. And the art director, uh, of course, to economize, you cannot move, it's a big crew. You cannot, you know, overdo it. The house of Sender is uh, in the suburb suburbs of Tel Aviv. We oh. found the stone house and all this. Uh, the mikveh was in Tiberias. Uh, a lot of the, uh, the Kabbalist uh, room was in Yafo. And so a lot of uh, events there. But the streets that you see are Mea Shari. And we had also used a candid camera. I mean, it's a big camera. It's a 35 millimeter camera. But we uh, left the camera, and all the crew was looking to other things. And the camera was running while Hanan is moving at the beginning. When he's passing through Orthodox uh, people, they were real. But we had police, uh, police closing the streets, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and uh, we, we, no. we finished unharmed, <laughs> basically. Thank you so much, Yossi Sommer.